All right, good morning. Let's get started. Grab your Bibles. If you don't have one, don't forget there's some in the back if you need one. Have you enjoyed this series in God's names? Yeah, I hope you're learning half as much as I'm learning. I'm learning a whole lot. This morning, though, before we get into the name, what do you notice on stage? Now, this has a lot to do with our message this morning, but I got to tell you, it's going to be a while before we figure out why. Okay, so I want you just to hang with me a little bit. I promise we'll bring it around, but for a while you're going to go, why are you telling me about this? But I, I promise we will get there. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I've had a telescope in my house before, and this is one of those things kind of like a treadmill. <laughs> Sounds like a great idea, and then it just holds clothes for the rest of its existence, right? Well, in fact, I had to go borrow one. We used to have a telescope in our house, and finally we're like, we got to get rid of that thing. But I want to talk about telescopes this morning. One of the things I did was to go learn a little bit about the telescope. Anyone have any idea when this thing was invented? Give me a guess. 1400s. 1500s. Do I hear 1600s? Yeah, it was in the 1600s. Actually, 1608. An eyeglass maker from the Netherlands by the name of Hans Lippershey. That's, that's him. That's the guy who invented this thing. Now, the first question you should ask is, why don't I know that? Why don't we know that it's Han Lippershey that invented the telescope? He's the first guy. When you think of the telescope, who do you think of? Galileo, which is this guy. He looks kind of the same, if you ask me. Galileo actually shows up instead of 1608 when Hans invented this. Galileo grabbed it in 1609, one year later. And he found Hans's invention, but Hans was using it for something different than what Galileo wanted to use it for. Hans was an eyeglass maker, so why do you think he invented this thing? To help people see. But he wanted to help people see things like right around here. Galileo said, look, if you take this thing and you tip it like this, what can you see? <laughs> Everything. You can see stars and planets. And Galileo took this simple invention and he, he stretched out into the cosmos. He went to look and, and he, he realized as he began to do that, he found a couple of things out. What did Galileo discover when he took the telescope and pointed it to the sky? Yeah, we're not the center of the universe. He figured out we rotate around the sun, which kind of blew people's minds. And then he found out the second fact. Anyone know? This is the one that got him in real trouble. The earth is round. He said that up until 1608, people thought the earth was flat, like a pancake. Right? You, can, you can see, it's flat, duh. I can see from here to there. There's no curving. Galileo got this thing out and said, no, we're, we're round, we're a globe. And the church, get this, the church said, no, -uh. you're wrong. This doesn't say it's round. This says, well, it didn't say anything, but they said it said it's flat. That's what they said it said. In fact, they excommunicated Galileo because he said the, the earth was round and it revolved around the sun and the church couldn't wrap its mind around that and Galileo was excommunicated until something like 1992. <laughs> he was. I mean, we hold on to our <laughs> convictions, don't we? But that's not the whole story of the telescope. Another guy came along and we don't know him for the telescope, but see if you recognize his picture. His selfie's all over that's our, that's our drummer, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. It just kind of looks like him. Who is that? Sir Isaac Newton. What do we know Sir Isaac Newton for? An apple dropped on his head. How'd you like that following you around in the rest of your life? But he actually, a few years after Galileo, actually 60 years, Isaac Newton took this telescope, which was modeled much like this. This is a straight telescope, right? The, lens, the light comes in, and you look on this end. You ever seen those big models with the thing on the side you look through? Yeah, isn't that crazy? That's called a reflective model. And, Ga and Isaac Newton, this guy, actually perfected that and made it even bigger and better. And, and he didn't get in trouble like Galileo did. He got in trouble for all kinds of other reasons, right? But he, he, he made this thing better. So let me ask you, what is any of that? I mean, it's good information, right? You can say, now you know. You learned something in church today. 
even if you learn nothing else, hopefully you learn at least one more thing. What does any of this have to do with the name of God that we're studying today? Any ideas? Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> so hold on. I just want you to put a pin in that, okay? And grab your Bibles and turn to Genesis 22. I promise we're going to figure out, we're going to get back to this. So hold on to that. And this morning, I want to tell you two stories. Can you hold two different stories in your head at the same time? Okay, so while you're turning to Genesis 22, which is actually our second story, I want to start by telling you the beginning of the first story. And it's my story, mine and Anita's story, our family's story. When I was 16 years old, I got a call into full-time ministry. 16 years old, I don't know nothing. God said, I want you to go into ministry. And I said, okay, sounds good. I was 16 years old. I didn't know what I was going to do. God called me into ministry. Sound like a good plan to me. So got married, went off to Bible college. We got called for my first pastorate to my home church in Lakewood, Colorado. And I've told part of this story before. I was all gung-ho, going to save the church. A few months in, God said, nope, I don't want you to save the church. I want you to shut it down. Great. That's what I signed up for. So we shut the church down. Found out I was really good at it. <laughs> but... I didn't want to do that. That's not what I was called to do. So I, I had a family, and we, we were just starting out. So I figured, I, 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 I learned somewhere along the way that you have to pay your bills and take care of your family. So I went and got a job, and I got a job at a place called American Express, which actually grew into Western Union. There was all kinds of corporate stuff that happened. And I woke up one day, 10 years later, I was still at Western Union. I thought, I need a change. So I went and worked for Visa for five years. Big change. <laughs> For like 15 plus years, I was in the corporate world until one day God came knocking on the door and said, hey, do you remember when you were 16 years old? And I said, no. <laughs> God said, you remember when you were 16 years old and I called you into ministry. So what happened to that call? And I said, well, I assumed it was done. He said, no, it's not done. I called you into ministry and now it's time for you to get back into it. And I said, wait a minute, time out. That doesn't make any sense. I've got a family now. I've got three kids now. We had just built a brand new home that was predicated on me having a corporate income. So I had three kids, full family that's growing, a brand new house, a mortgage, all the bills. I think at the time I had a fancy car, you know, the whole works. And God said, I want you to quit, not the Prius. <laughs> God said, I want you to quit that job and I want you to go into the lucrative business of pastoring. <laughs> Not so much. And I told God very simply, that makes absolutely no sense. You've lost your mind. Okay, I want you to put a pin in that story. God asking us to do something that made no sense. Now I want you to dive back in. Let's dive into Genesis chapter 22. Speaking about a, a great story, but a story that makes no sense. Sometime later, now let's stop right there. Sometime later, it's under, important that we understand what had happened just before this. And we've been talking about this actually the last few weeks. This is a story about Abraham. And God made a promise to Abraham. What was the promise he made to Abraham? Yeah, I'm going to make you the father of many nations, a whole generation. In fact, he said, look up to the stars, and as many as you can see, that's how many descendants you're going to have. And he gave this promise to Abraham, but it didn't happen the way... Abraham thought in the time that Abraham thought. In fact, a couple weeks ago, we talked about, you know, Abraham and Sarah tried to make things happen for God and it got him into all kinds of trouble. Well, it's like 10 years later, they finally have their son and they name him Isaac. He's the, can you imagine being Isaac, the promised one? I mean, nothing could happen to Isaac, right? Not so much. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac. You think God wanted to make sure he knew who he was talking about? Whom you love so much and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. There's all kinds of wrong in that sentence. See, we hear this story over and over again, and it just says, well, yeah, of course, we know what's going to happen. Abraham did not know what was going to happen. What did God just ask him to do? Kill your son. I, actually, what I want you to do is travel 50 miles, go to a mountain you don't know, and I want you to kill him there. Now, first of all, can you kill Isaac? Does that make sense? No, why not? He's the promised one. 
He's, he's the one that God had promised and had given to them. He's the fulfillment of God's promise. There's another problem. Is he allowed to kill his son? No, it's one of the rules. We looked it up, right? Of course, it's a rule to come, but even Abraham knew that you don't kill people, and you certainly don't... What's he asking him to do? Oh, sacrifice him as a burnt offering. That's the stuff in bad movies. So... We, we, you get to pay. What would you say to that? Let's say God came to you and said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sacrifice your one and only son on a burnt offering at a mountain I'm going to send you to. What would you say to God? I, I don't think I heard you right. right. Speaking of my good ear, I don't think I heard what you said. And even if you thought that's exactly what God said, well, what would you do next? If you thought God had told you to do something like that? I, I would go ask some people. This is what I thought I heard God say. What do you think? And what would all of those people say? No, you heard wrong. There's no way God told you to do that. But God was very clear to Abraham. So listen to what Abraham did. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He didn't even sleep in. He got up early the next day. He saddled his donkey, took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place that God had told him about. Now, I want you to listen to all the messianic imagery in this story. Okay, we've already had some. I want you to sacrifice your what? Your one and only son. And I want you to do it on a mountain. I'm going to take some wood, right? On the third day of their journey. Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little further. We will worship there, then we will come back. Interesting. Did he actually believe that, or was that for Isaac's sake? Because it wouldn't have sounded good if he said, we will go worship, and then I will come back. He'd had a lot of explaining to do, right? So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders. There's some imagery for you. While he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them walked on together. They're walking up the mountain for Isaac to be sacrificed and Isaac is carrying the wood for the sacrifice. Sound familiar? This sounds like a story we've heard before. Where am I? Verse seven. Isaac turned, as the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, this is the moment Abraham has been dreading. Yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire in the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Isaac is putting two and two together. He probably thinks dad's lost it. Dad lost his keys again, right? He doesn't know where his glasses are. He lost the sheep. Verse eight, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told them to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. This next sentence makes no sense. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. What doesn't make sense in that sentence? He tied him and Isaac let him. Isaac let him do this. Isaac... Abraham's an old dude. He's over 110 years old. Is he picking his son up and putting him on the altar? No, Logan, stand up for a second. This is my boy. You think I'm picking him up and putting him on an altar? No. You, yeah, you can sit down again. Abraham wasn't doing it either. So Isaac got on the wood himself, voluntarily. He did it. Again, sound familiar? Sounds like a good story, doesn't it? Verse 10, and Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. But at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Do not lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Even the very end of the story is familiar. See, we are Isaac and the ram is Jesus. God provided the sacrifice. It's a good story, isn't it? But it doesn't have a whole lot to do. Have you heard the name of God yet? Hasn't come up. I want you to hear this story because I want you to tell you that what we're going to talk about this morning has to do with this story, but it's not this story. 
There's all kinds of, I could preach a whole series on this story. But what we want to talk about this morning is the next sentence, verse 14. Abraham named that place Yahweh Yaira, or Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. See, I told you my story, God asking me to do something impossible, to do something that didn't make any sense. He also asked Abraham to do something that didn't make any sense. But I want to tell you one more thing that doesn't make any sense. I wish you could have seen me this week in preparing for this message. In fact, I'm thinking of doing that. Would you be interested in seeing how a sermon comes together over the course of a week? All right, so we're thinking of putting that together. So, which means you need to be on Facebook and YouTube. That's the shameless plug, all right? Now we're moving on. I was studying this week, and I got to Jehovah Jireh, and one of the things I want to do is I want to take the word apart and understand the words. I know what Jehovah means. What does Jehovah mean? The Lord. It means God. Now, Jireh, what does Jireh mean? Well, if you just read this, you know what it means. What's it mean? Provide. Provide. So God provides. So I went to, and I knew I was expecting something, you know, it's something I do, especially if I've gotten into this series. I click on the name, I know what it says because the Bible has already told me what it says. So I went to the name and I've got this fancy program and you click on the name and it shows you, it brings you up a dictionary that shows you what the name means, what the word means. Well, I clicked on it and the little thing pops up over here and so it says Jaira, shows me the Hebrew word Jaira. And I read it and it said Jaira means to see. That's the moment I wish you could have seen. Because I'm looking just like you are right now. What? It doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't mean to see. What does it mean? To provide. I mean, the Bible says so right there, right? So I figured was something's wrong with my program or I did something wrong. Well, I've got a different program or different part of this program I can pull up. So I went to look at the word a different way and I pulled up a different dictionary and I went to this word and I clicked on it and it said Jehovah Jireh and it says Jireh means to see. Okay, that's twice. So I decided, well, maybe the digital stuff is letting me down. So I went to my bookshelf and I pulled a book off. They make those still. I pulled a book off the shelf. It's called the Strong's Concordance. Anyone ever use the Strong's Concordance? There's a reason they digitized it, because it's hard. So I had to go look up this verse, and you look up the verse, and you find the word that you want, and there's a number that's right by the word. And you go to the, you find the number, and then you go to the other part of the Bible, the book, at the back of the book, and you find the number, the same number. So you gotta remember the name, the number, and you gotta be in the Old Testament, not the New Testament, because it's divided. So I went and I found that number, and I found it said Jireh, right there. And I was ready to be vindicated. And it said, Jireh means to see. I said, well, now I got a problem. Because the Bible says it says provide, but everything I'm reading says it means to see. I can't teach that. So in fact, the real problem was I realized, so what it's saying is, is that Jehovah Jireh means God sees, but we've already done that name. You remember a few weeks ago we did El Roy? What does El Roy mean? God sees. In fact, it was the story of Hagar when Abraham tried to do God's job and, and fulfill the promise of God and Hagar, and Hagar was all freaking out and ran away from Sarah and said, God sees me. God knows who I am. He sees into the depths of my soul. Well, it's a different word, but it's translated the same. God sees. So I had to figure, try to figure out, okay, what do I do now? So I went to look up where, maybe this is just, Maybe I'm not understanding something. So the other thing this little program can do is show me everywhere in the Bible that that word, Jaira, is used. And it's used over 48 times in the Old Testament. Five times it's used in Genesis 22. Of those five times, three times it's translated provide, and two times it's translated see. Let me show you. Verse four is the first time it shows up. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He saw. That's the word gyra. That's the first time. It's translated to see. Then we go to verse 8. Isaac has asked Abraham, where's the sheep? And, God, and Abraham says, God will provide a sheep. That's the word gyra. So what does he really mean? God will see a sheep. Doesn't make as much sense, does it? Well, maybe that's why they translated it that way. Verse 13, then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thickets. That's the same word, Jaira. Verse 14, it comes up twice. Jehovah Jaira, the Lord will provide, and on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. 
So the word even is used five times in this chapter, and it's not translated the same way. Very frustrating. So I thought, well, maybe it's my Bible. So I went and got a different Bible, and a different one, and a different one. And guess what? They all do exactly the same thing. And I got a little frustrated. And I was trying to figure out, what does this mean? We had a conversation about it, and we, I, I kept trying to study it and figure out what it means. And by Tuesday, I actually finally got it. I was looking at all these scholars to, to explain to me why they translated this word differently in this one chapter, and only one was able to explain it. And by the time I heard it, it was like, duh, of course. I get it. I understand it now. And now we come back to the telescope. See, God sees things that we don't see, Right? Does God see clearer or fuzzier than you see things? Does he see the big picture or the little picture? He sees every picture. You know, they keep trying to make bigger telescopes. You know that? And not only are they making big telescopes, but they're trying to put them in different places. Hubble telescope, where did they put that one? (laughs) Into space. You know why? Because they found out the atmosphere was bending light, so they couldn't quite tell. They thought something was right there. You ever had a fish in a pond, and you thought you could grab it, but it's in a different spot? Same thing was happening with our atmosphere. So we'll put the telescope out into space. Now, forget the fact that it was broken. They didn't do it right. It's still a pretty cool idea, right? They put it out there so that they could see farther and see things clearer. I love, but this is, just, this is a free little message here. You don't have to pay for this one. Uh, they keep trying to see further and further and further, and they're going to keep looking further and further and further because it keeps going on and on and on, but God sees everything. Amen? Amen. See, God sees things that you and I don't see. He saw something that Abraham didn't see, didn't he? Did what God asked Abraham to do make sense? No. No. Abraham did it anyway because he thought, he trusted that God might see something that he couldn't see. I want to come back to my story for a second. See, God asked me to quit a lucrative corporate job and all the security of it, and he wanted me to take a pastor's job, not even a lead pastor job at the time. He said, I want you to take that job, and and I, I know you've got a family and you've got this mortgage, and I want you to do that. And I said, um, God, I'm not so sure about that. Here's what I'll do. If you can, if Anita says yes, then I'll do it. (laughs) That's a cop out. So if you can get my wife to say yes, then I'm all in. Now, I made it sound more spiritual than that. What I said was, I'm scared of her. And so I went to tell her, and I took her to Qdoba and Parker, and we sat on the patio where there were witnesses. And I told her what I thought God was telling us. I think he's telling us to do this. And she said, I don't think so. I like this, the life we have. I like what, why would God mess that up? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense. We can't afford it. We can't live on, on that kind of money. You made me buy this house, and you made me have these children. It's all your fault not wrong. So we went and we prayed about it. And we felt God was telling us to do it. Did it make any sense? No, in fact, we talked to people and they said, that didn't make any sense. But if God is telling you to do it, you better do it. And so we did it. And we went seven months and we were, ends did not meet. We were chewing away our savings. And this is how God works. He waited till the last second. And we weren't sure how we were going to make the next month's mortgage payment. We weren't sure how we were going to make ends meet, but we knew we were being faithful to what we trusted that God could see something that we couldn't see. And in that seventh month, I got a phone call from an old boss who said, hey, we need like 10 hours of uh, consulting work and you can do it anywhere, anytime. You can do it on the weekends. You can do it when you're not working. You can do it at the church for all I care. It doesn't matter to me and we'll pay you some money to do it. Is that something you'd be interested in? I said, I don't know. Let me, let me talk to some people. So he talked to my boss at the time here. I wasn't lead pastor. I said, would that work? He said, sure, as long as it doesn't mess up what you're doing here. I don't care. And so uh, we talked and we said, how much would it take? And we came up with a number that was absurdly high because we, had to, we, we said, this is the gap. Let's figure out the gap. And so I went back. I called my boss, that old boss, and I said, hey, I'll do it, but here's the number. And he said, okay. <laughs> First, my thought was the number was too low. I, <laughs> should have gone higher. But then I, I came back and I told Anita, and I said, isn't that the way God does things? Isn't that how God works? That if you're faithful, 
God will provide because he sees things. Did I have any idea a boss I had two bosses ago was going to call me out of the blue and offer me a job I could have ever dreamed would fit into my life schedule? And we did that for four years, by the way, until finally we were able to sell our house and move into a different house. That's how God works. God saw and God provided. Because God saw something we couldn't see. He sees things in ways we can't see them. He sees with a clarity that we don't have. He sees with a precision that we don't have. He sees further down the road than we can see. He says, if you will trust me, and there's the trouble, isn't it? If you will trust me, the question is, do you really trust God? Now we say, of course, until God asks us to do something like sacrifice our son or give up the lucrative corporate job or whatever God's asking you to do. It's easy to trust God when the answers are easy, right? Do you really trust God? Do you trust him with your actions? Do you act like you trust him? Our job is very simple. And I actually wrote it up on the board and I realized this morning after first service, go ahead and put our job up on the board, our part is faith demonstrated through obedience. Doesn't that sound, I mean, that just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? I want you to to ignore that, all right? Here's your job. Trust God. Trust him. That's what that means. That's a fancy way of saying it. But it means you can't just trust him. You gotta act like you trust him. You gotta do the things that God is calling you to do. Act on the things God is telling you to do. Don't just say you trust him. Really trust him. That's your job. That's your part. What's God's part? God will provide. You trust that God sees things and will provide for you. Oh, and by the way, he's going to provide to build his kingdom, not yours. And don't have a plan B. Do you remember when Peyton Manning showed up in town? And everyone, and John always said, Peyton Manning is plan A. And someone said, what's plan B? And he said, there is no plan B. See, Abraham had a plan B 10 years ago, didn't he? He said, God's not coming through in my time. God's not coming through the way we think it's going to. So I'll try and make God's plan happen. But that wasn't his job. His job was to trust God. When we try and do God's job, we mess it up. And we mess it up big. Like all the trouble in the Middle East comes back to that moment when Abraham did not trust God. So don't cause the Middle East by not trusting God. (laughs) That's big, isn't it? (laughs) But that's what happens. You do your job, God will do his job. Don't try and do God's job. You don't see things the way that he sees them. But again, that's easier said than done, isn't it? God sees things you can't see. Just trust him with it. Trust him to do his job and stop doing his job. Amen? And by the way, all of that ties back. I've been trying to get this into a sermon for a long time. Parents, do you sometimes see things that your kids don't see? And when they ask you why, what's the famous parent answer? Because I said so. You know what I said so means? Because I see things you can't see. And I can't even explain it to you. God sees things you can't see, and he can't explain it to you. You wouldn't believe him if he told you. You'd think he was crazy. Do things God's way anyway. Amen? Let's stand and pray. Father, thank you for being Jehovah Jireh, the God who sees, and because he sees, he provides. Thank you that you always come through. Your word says you never fail us. You never let us down. We even sang about it, that your ways are higher than our ways. There are things happening and that you want for us that if we'll just trust you, they will happen. Well, Father, I confess, and on behalf of everyone here, I confess, together we confess, that sometimes we try and do your job because we're not sure, well, we are sure that you're not gonna do it our way and you're not gonna do it in our timing. Father, help us to have that kind of faith, to trust you, to know that Jehovah Jireh is always going to come through because he sees things that we don't see and he wants things for us that we can only have if we have faith, if we trust in in, in the God who's going to provide for us. Help us do that. Help us in our unbelief. Father, it's not perfect. We're not perfect. 
We're trying to do better at it, and we're going to falter, we're going to fail, but we know that if we continue with the right heart and with the right attitude, that you are going to work things out even in that case. Father, thank you for being the God who provides, who gives us the victory, who gives us everything that we need. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Go do your job. And part of your job is stack a chair. God bless you. Have a good one.